So it's my great pleasure to introduce Chango Pan, who is a staff scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab in the Computer Science and Mathematics Division. Are you also in the Biosciences Division as well? Uh, matrix into Ma that. Okay. Matrix Internet. <laughs> um, and in addition to his primary appointment at Oak Ridge, he's also got adjunct appointments um, at, with two um, affiliations here at UT. One is the Genome Science and Technology Graduate Program, and then the other is my home department of microbiology, where he's a uh, joint faculty member. So just as a, by way of a quick introduction, I should mention that Chango had contacted um, Colleen Johnson last semester because he wanted to see perhaps um, where he might have an opportunity to interact with folks at Nimbus, and so she suggested that a great place to start would be to come give a seminar and introduce himself um, to folks here. And so by way of a quick background, um, so Chongol uh, has his, uh, um, a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from a university in Shanghai, and his PhD is actually from the Genome Sense Science and Technology program here at UT, and he received that in 2006, and he's been at Oak Ridge since then. Um, and so Chongol's going to tell you a bit today about um, the various types of things that his lab does. So he really focuses on um, omics data, so that would be proteomics data, metagenomics, man, metatranscriptomics, and metabolomics data. He um, is interested in trying to use those data to figure out um, aspects of the physiologies of natural microbial communities in a variety of different environments, um, from really human impacted areas like acid mine drainage systems to coastal marine environments to the human gut. And so in addition to analyzing these volumes of data, one of the things that his lab focuses on is developing new algorithms to look at these data. So please welcome Chongle and give him your attention. Okay, thanks Alison for the nice introduction. So I think she pretty much covered what I want to say here. Basically my focus is really on this uh, different omics management. This will generate a lot of data. Then we develop a, a bioinformatics tool to analyze data. So particularly we focus on using high performance computing to do the bioinformatic analysis. So we collaborate a lot with a lot of biology to do microbial ecology and uh, microbial physiology. So today I actually want to tell you a study that we did with uh, JJ Chai. So for, for those of you who know her, she actually did a two-year postdoc in NIMBIOS Institute. Then when she graduated from NIMBIOS, we then hired her into our lab. So the question we ask is, uh, since uh, her background is in uh, uh, evolutionary biology, and uh, she did receive uh, excellent training in the dis interdisciplinary research in NIMBIOS, so we asked if she play, we place her into our group, what we can achieve. So we have done a lot of uh, microbial ecology study where we do 16S profiling. So for example, we compare two samples with 16S genotyping. Then we found, for example, Rhodopsonomonas uh, uh, bacteria is more abundant in one type of condition. Then microbiology tells us, oh, it tends to do this, anaerobic, anaerobic degradation and aromatic compounds. Then we can make some inference. So you probably hear this kind of statement uh, very often. But then all my question is, uh, can we be more quantitative than this? So a lot of biology has been this qualitative uh, empirical observations. So can we first, uh, if we can say this in, uh, about uh, pseudocinomonas, can we make the kind of statement for other bacteria? So this is a vertical inheritance. We have all these different taxa uh, in the tree. Can we make a, a general statement on how, for each of these taxa, what are, are their functional uh, characteristics? And uh, instead of using this typical general, can we quantify that? So this is really pushing this uh, uh, observation to more quantitative uh, measurements. Then the other interesting thing you can see is uh, this function. So for example, you don't hear people say, this bacteria can do antibiotic resistance, because that's a very uh, general function. It, uh, most of microbes can pick it up by horizontal gene transfer. But some uh, functions tend to be more sticky to a certain phylum. So we answer the question of, Given all the different uh, functions, what is their propensity to do horizontal chain tra 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 transfer versus a vertical gene transfer? So we want to answer these two questions by big omics data. So here we so far, um, we have, there are 14,000 uh, prokaryotic genomes in the gene bank. And uh, this is uh, a tree we constructed uh, based on the uh, genome sequences. 
So they covered uh, all these different phylum. So we cover, this is a color coded uh, in this tree. So you can see the phylogen, this phylogenetic tree agrees in general with the taxonomic classification. And all these uh, um, blue dots are generally come from this uh, um, phylum. Click, click. So I need to be careful about the taxonomy and taxonomy and the phylogenetic classification. And we also labeled uh, the how complete this genome is. So this is the number of contacts for each, for each of those genomes. So by looking at uh, all this uh, sequence microbe, microbial genomes, we can get a sense about uh, what uh, function are encoded in those uh, genomes. So this re requires we do something called a function annotation. So all this genome in um, gene, uh, gene, uh, gene bank are annotated. So it, but the problem with all those existing annotations is that they are deposited uh, by different teams. So of course, different teams have different way of annotating proteins in the genome. So that means we cannot compare, eas we cannot easily compare two genomes um, by their uh, deposit uh, annotation in the gene bank. The other problem is uh, these genomes are sequenced uh, over the course of the la last 20 years. That means even for the same lab, they, for them on JGI, they deposit a lot of genomes, but uh, the pipeline done in the early 90s are very different from the pipeline they use uh, now. So that means all of you do have a lot of genomes, but their annotations are not cons consistent for doing this kind of phylogenomic analysis. So alternatively, we can do this. Basically, we can build, get an existing pipeline and then re-annotate everything in the genome. The problem is a lot of these existing, existing pipelines are not scalable. It's very hard to run this pipeline across uh, 14,000 different uh, genomes. So really, to solve these two problems, uh, we proposed a different approach. That's uh, we have to develop a new database called a uh, Unifan database. So this will allow us to do, to do the function annotation in a high throughput manner. This is a, a workflow of our uh, genome annotation. So first, uh, we take uh, the current uh, Unifan database. That includes uh, all the uh, available protein sequences. And uh, within this uh, Unifan uh, database, there's a subset of protein called uh, SwissPro. Those SwissPro proteins has a manually curated uh, annotation that include easy number of go terms. We first uh, clustered all those proteins in Unif uh, Unipro into clusters. So we used a very tight criteria, 90% identity. So we make sure that all the protein clustered together does belong to one protein family. Then we transferred uh, the SwissPro function annotation into that cluster. Then finally, we have uh, the cluster. We did a, a multiple six alignment, and we built a hammer model for those uh, uh, families. So here, this gives us a unifam family uh, database. So in total, we have about um, uh, 267,000 uh, families in the unifam database. So once we have this, then we can go back to the genome annotation. So this is the step. First, we download all the genome sequence from the gene bank. Then we do gene prediction with the protocol. So this will give us the proteins that are encoded uh, in all the genomes. Then we search those proteins against our Unifan database. So this gives us the function annotation for those proteins. So that's include uh, a consistent uh, protein name and a cons easy number of Go terms. So all this uh, can be compared uh, across all these uh, thousands of different uh, genomes. Once we have this uh, function annotation, then we can use the pathway tool to build a metabolic network. So this will tell us what the pathways are encoded uh, in these different microbes. So all this is a very um, computational expensive uh, step. So in this study, we used uh, Titan in Oak Ridge. So that's the largest uh, supercomputer in the US. So this will uh, allow us to finish uh, these 14,000 genomes reannotation in a timely fashion. So come back to the original question. Um, we mentioned uh, uh, microbiology also tells us certain uh, taxa has certain uh, uh, functional characteristics. So here's uh, the way we do it. So this is uh, different families, and this is the family name. We totally have uh, 13, uh, 33 genomes from this family. And uh, we, did, uh, we collected all the first and most enriched goal term. By enrichment, we mean that so if this is a, a average, it's a random distribution, we would expect that um, you would uh, see 300 uh, occurrence of this goal term in the uh, genome that belongs to this uh, um, phyla. But actually, in this uh, family, we observed uh, uh, a thousand times of this uh, goal term, and we can calculate a p-value. 
So this is that in this way, we can quantify what is the function that's enriched in these different uh, families. So of course, you can see even from the name, it's a, it's a bacteria that related, uh, it's archaea related to methanogenesis. Of course, we see that uh, in the functional analysis, we did see that we have uh, enrichment in the methanogenesis, particularly methanogenesis from carbon dioxide. So this is another example of uh, a family. So in this family, it, it probably performed more of the lactate oxidization and the oxalate uh, catabolic process. So corresponding, this comes from an, a, a different uh, uh, phylum, genus. In, for example, in this uh, family, it can do more of this uh, ion transportation and uh, proton transportation. And uh, here, for, th for uh, this one, it's probably more enriched function in relation to a cytochrome. So we have a cytochrome uh, complex assembly and also a heme biosynthesis pathway. So this will give us a sort of an encyclopedia to tell you that if you found certain um, um, phylum that's uh, enriched in certain conditions, we can check back to this table and tell you that what functions it probably will have in this function, uh, in this community, and we can give you a quantitative enrichment level. So next, uh, let's look at uh, the metabolic pathways. So in this uh, axis, we showed uh, the, the gen genera. So this means uh, for all these functions, we put genomes, we put them at the genus, genus level. Then we took the union of all the pathways that's encoded in this, pro in this uh, uh, genomes. So this axis is the uh, pathways. The red means this pathway is present in this genera. The, blue, the gray means it's absent. And we did a, a two-dimensional clustering. Tell us, uh, do you have any uh, consistency between the uh, taxonomy versus the functional profile? So first, we can look at the bacteria versus archaea. It's a pretty uh, different. So we have all this archaea is uh, located here. And they tend to have these pathways. And uh, they tend not to have these pathways. Then let's look at the phylum level. So this is the different uh, phylums that we, look, uh, that we have in the uh, phylogenomic study. So in general, you can see that uh, um, genera from the same phylum, they tend to cross into blocks. So if now you have a, a block of this blue here that's coming from proteobacteria, and also you have a block of this uh, acetobacteria here. They all tend to have a similar functions, functional profile. But at the same time, you can see these blocks are scattered around. So basically, you do have a different subgroup, functional subgroups within the same uh, phylum. Then let's look at uh, in more detail. So this is again that a phylogenetic tree reconstructed uh, from the whole genome sequence. Then here we particularly look at uh, um, nine different pathways. The first one is the TRA charging. So you can see we found a TRA charging across all the genomes. So you can say it's a universal pathway. So if you look at the outermost uh, pathway, that's the lysine uh, biosynthesis. It's uh, pretty concentrated, so you can see that's it's uh, encoding in this arc that corresponding to this uh, whole, um, in this um, uh, branch of the tree. And also it's found in here, that's corresponding to this branch of the tree, in uh, this, the, perp the blue one in uh, here. So on the other hand, uh, you have some other pathway that's more scattered. So we can look at the next one, the, uh, the green one, this, this iso isopenicillin biosynthesis. So you can see when they are present in certain phylum, they are not a, uh, very consistent, they can be present and absent. And also they can be very scattered in here. So that means uh, this pathway can undergo many gene loss and a gene gain function in the evolutionary history. So can we be more quantitative than that? Can we push ourselves a bit more? Then we constructed a pathway tree. So you probably know the species tree and the, um, and the gene trees. So here we did a, a pathway tree. This is how we constructed it. So first we take the, that original uh, path, uh, phylogenetic tree. Then we can label all the uh, terminal tips with the present and absent um, status of the pathway. Then we just use the parsimonial uh, principle, basically how we can reach this kind of uh, uh, current observed uh, status by introducing the minimum number of gainage and the losses event in the evolutionary history. So for example, in this arsenate detoxification uh, pathway, it's a uh, um, we can infer the, as the status of that pathway in the, intern, the, in the internal node, that means the ancestral uh, prof, um, profile. So here, this uh, red dot means is a, a gain event. The 
blue dot means this last event. So the first time this uh, as a, uh, isolated detoxification that occurred in evolution history is in here. And uh, then it immediately went to uh, gene loss event. Then you lost uh, everything in this branch. But it uh, maintained that all in all this uh, subtree, it maintained that uh, pathway. So by use, uh, making this uh, parsimonia assumption, we can actually reconstruct the what's the ancestral metabolic capability of uh, this different uh, um, uh, phyla. So here, to quantify that, we can use uh, something called a parsimonial score. So that's uh, simply uh, the number of uh, total gain and, and loss event in the evolutionary history. And uh, in here, we identified uh, this uh, from 2000 genomes. If you compare these two pathways, this is the mercury detoxification pathway, they are identified in approximately the same number of genomes. But the mercury detoxification had a much higher parsimonial score. That means it went to much more frequent gain and loss event. So this would uh, tell us that uh, this uh, mercury detoxification, they are like uh, antibody resistance. Basically, they can be um, gained uh, mu much more frequently by horizontal gene transfer. And also, they can be lost uh, frequently through the genome contraction. And uh, this is a part of the indication of uh, this is a more of uh, adaptation to the environment. If there's an environmental stress of mercury, they can probably pick it up from other organisms. On the other hand, uh, this uh, arsenate of detoxification uh, went through a much less uh, uh, freak, um, number of uh, gain and loss event. So this is a probably more indicated. This is uh, uh, defining this uh, taxon uh, in this certain clay. If you take this two number, take this number divided by this number, this will tell you the retention index. The higher retention index means it's uh, more prone to do the horizon transfer. The lower one means it's more sticky in the evolution. This is another example. So this is a uh, uh, phosphorus acquisition versus nitrogen fixation. Both, both phosphorus and nitrogen are two essential nutrients. And this is the two way they can gain it. So these two uh, pathways have a similar number of uh, parsimonial score, but the uh, phosphorus is uh, much more prevalent than nitrogen. So this means for nitrogen, it's uh, retained uh, in smaller number of phylum, but uh, once it's uh, gained, it went through a lot of, it's very, it's, uh, it doesn't uh, get lost uh, very frequent, and it cannot gain uh, very frequent. But uh, phosphorus acquisition is uh, much more, you know, going through much more frequent uh, loss and gains. So this really tells you that different function does have different uh, uh, propensity to do the uh, hormone gene transfer. I mean, the evolution is also, make, also makes sense. If uh, the function is very compact, it's in your know, upron, then it, it can be transferred much easier. If it's uh, very scattered, it requires a lot of other functions, then it's uh, much harder to do the horizontal chain transfer. So we then we can do this for all the pathways. In total, in uh, MetaPsych, there are about uh, 500 uh, pathways. And uh, then here, we first measure how frequent do they occur in all these nearly uh, 15,000 uh, genomes. So this is a uh, distribution. So most, there are very few universal pathways, but there are also, uh, but there are also a lot of pathways that's um, occurring only in very, very few genomes. So this is a parsimonial score. O also, this is distribution. So most of them has uh, pretty uh, less than a few hundred uh, uh, gains and losses. Then we can calculate their retention index. So here we define a, an arbitrary cutoff. If it's greater than 0.9, that means uh, is uh, tends to be more consistent with the uh, phylogenetic tree. If it's less than 0.7, that means it uh, can be um, go through frequent uh, gain and losses in the evolution. So in summary, that, uh, here we took uh, an observation that uh, microbiology often had with a lot of different uh, microbial taxa, and we quantified uh, those observations through uh, a big omics data. We looked at uh, 14,000 different genomes, so specific we qu quantify the consistency of gain and losses of cellular function with the uh, species evolution. And also, we determine uh, what's the functional characteristic of the different organisms by their taxonomic classification. And uh, we were also able to do this because JJ had uh, her evolutionary back biology background in here. And also, we were able to provide her with a high computing uh, background. So this is an example of uh, how in BIOS and MATLAB can have some kind of interesting intersections. So let me switch gear to a completely different uh, topic. So that's the microbial uh, physiology. This is a, a popular tree. Um, oftentimes, there are a lot of different microbes associated with the plant root. So here, in a project, our collaborator 
uh, isolated uh, endof endophyte fungi from the tree uh, root. It's called a Motorella in gaunt ada. So this is a micro uh, fungi that can grow inside the root. And uh, inside this uh, fungi, they identified an uh, endobacteria. So really, we have a Russian doll system here. We have a, a tree root inside, we can find a fungi. And inside a fungi, we can find an uh, endobacteria. So the question is, uh, what's the symbolic mechanism among these different organisms? This is the first question. The second question is, uh, we know this uh, plant associated organisms tend to help them to do uh, nutrient acquisition. Like they they can, can help the plant acquire nitrogen and phosphorus from the environment. So the first question we ask is, uh, how does this system respond to nitrogen limitation? To our first, uh, to design a simple experiment, we, can de we did a uh, culture of this, co this uh, uh, symbolic system under four different conditions. First, uh, we have nitrogen rich versus nitrogen poor. And also we have uh, uh, used antibiotics to suppress the population of endobacteria. We have a normal antibac antibacterial population versus antibiotic resistant antibiotic resistant antibiotic re suppressed antibacterial population. So four conditions, each condition we have a biological triplicate. This is a uh, growth curve of this uh, uh, co-culture under these four conditions. They all have uh, a lag phase in the first 24 hours, then rapid growth in the next uh, 48 hours, then the growth is slowed down. Then this allowed us to do the sampling at the same time point. So we sampled uh, at uh, 40, 72 hours for all four conditions. And also you can look at uh, the axis is uh, uh, very different between those four conditions. In here, we have uh, um, nitrogen bacteria suppressed growth curve, and here is the normal endobacterial population. So by comparing the axis, you can see that by suppressing the endobacteria, the fungal can actually accumulate uh, more biomass during the 72 hours. And uh, for, the, for these two conditions, they're nitrogen poor. And of course, you would expect that they have a much less uh, uh, growth rate than the nitrogen rich condition. Then in this study, we combined uh, proteomics and uh, metabolomics to study this system. So this again, this is uh, our four conditions times the biological triplicate. So we use the proteomics to do, uh, and we use the proteomics to match all the proteomes in these conditions. The proteomics will tell us the enzyme abundance change and also we checked the uh, PTM abundance chan changes. So we looked at uh, specifically phosphorylation and acetylation. Uh, we also collaborated with the Sean Companions Lab and they did uh, the metabolomics uh, for, our, for this study. So here we can um, uh, measure the concentration changes of uh, metabolites and also there are different uh, aerosteric factors, concentration changes. Then Joe, Joe did the proteomics also uh, Joe integrated the, all this uh, big omics data into a metabolic network. This is a global statistics uh, results. So this is the uh, four conditions. And uh, we, for proteomics, uh, because we can separate the proteins into endobacteria and a fungi, we can tell you what's the protein abundance of these two organisms. As expected, uh, the uh, and the body resistance uh, greatly suppresses the endobacterial population. If you compare this to nitrogen rich condition, it uh, decreases the population of the endobacteria by almost um, tenfold. But what, uh, what's interesting is the nitrogen poor condition actually boosted the relative abundance of this endobacteria significantly. So you can compare the nitrogen uh, poor uh, versus nitrogen rich with a normal concentration, with a normal population of endobacteria. So it went from 0.4% uh, to uh, 6.5 percent. So basically, really, the endobacteria is uh, um, they don't really care about the nitrogen constraint faced by the host. So proteomics identified about uh, 4,000 proteins from the uh, fungal host. It uh, covered about uh, one third of the fungal uh, genome. For the endobacteria, we identified about uh, 680 protein in this particular condition. They also covered about one third of the endobacteria genome. In the other conditions, we are now not able to identify a lot of endobacterial protein because they are low relative abundances. And also we identify a lot of uh, phosphorylation and acidation events. Metabolomics uh, provided about uh, the concentration changes of 92 metabolite changes across uh, these four uh, conditions. Then given these results, we can do comparisons um, pairwise for them here. We compared with the normal endobacterial population, what's the perturbation of nitrogen limitation so we can look at which proteins are up and down regulated, uh, which PTMs are up and down regulated, uh, and same thing with uh, uh, metabolomics. 
So I think a lot of you guys probably are familiar with this kind of data. So it's uh, right now, generally this data, this data is more and more becoming easier and easier. But the difficult part is uh, how do you mine a biological story from this big omics data? So here we want to show you uh, how Joe did in this study. So this is a uh, one simple reaction. And uh, here we showed you the full change of uh, nitrogen poor condition relative to control that's nitrogen rich. And we have the uh, enzyme bundle change by proteomics. So this converts the alanine to uh, glutamate. So this nitrogen goes from here to here. So this uh, enzyme bundle change uh, increased by sixfold. That means you can see that this, uh, um, the flux rate of this uh, reaction increased a lot. But uh, the confusing thing is this, this is actually a reversible reaction. So we know this important, this flux increased a lot, but actually we don't know which direction. So we don't know you have the boundary wants to move from here to here, or this from here to here. Fortunately, we have also metabolomics data. So metabolomics tell you the abundance change of this metabolites. So for example, alanine's uh, abundance increased by sixfold. So note that uh, metabolomics doesn't tell you the flux rate. It only tells you on this condition, you have this much uh, enzyme uh, metabolite. In this condition, it has sixfold more. It doesn't tell you in this condition, it's this being uh, produced more or consumed more or vice versa. So you have a um, multiple way to explain this. But if we put these two together, we can figure this out. So to determine the reaction direction, you can look at the reaction quotient. So just take the concentration of the product divided by the concentration of the sub uh, product divided by the concentration of uh, the product. If this uh, reaction quotient is greater than equilibrium constant, they move in reverse direction, so vice versa. Of course, metabolomics doesn't tell you the concentration, and we don't know the reaction, the equilibrium constant of this enzyme, but we can take their ratio. So we can take the, uh, look at what's the reaction quotient changes between these two diff different conditions, because we know their full change. So in this case, we see this reaction quotient increase by six-fold. So this also makes sense. You can see that the, these two reactants, they have much higher concentration increase than the reactant on this side. That means by the principle of thermodynamics, the organism really want to push the, the flow, the connection flux from the alanine to glutamate. And uh, it also increased uh, the enzyme abundance to accommodate the higher uh, flux. So this also implies that uh, the a fungal can achieve this, uh, this fungal organism can achieve this kind of um, antibody regulation by uh, multi-model regulation. This, in this case, it increased the abundance change, uh, the enzyme abundance, also the uh, reactant abundances. Then let's follow this uh, step. So next, this glutamate can be converted to glutamine. And also we see this uh, glutamine synthesis increase the abundance by threefold, corresponding for the other uh, reactions, the enzyme abundance decreased uh, uh, significantly. So this tells us, uh, although also this enzyme characterizes an uh, irreversible reaction. So here, the, um, to speed up the production of glutamine, the enzyme, the fungal organism actually increased both the enzyme concentration, also the uh, reaction, the substrate uh, concentration. So you can, this is uh, the kinetics constant. This is the flux rate of the reaction. You can increase the reaction rate by the enzyme concentration, also substrate concentration. Really, the organism is trying to increase uh, the production rate by both means to push this through. But interestingly, this product, their concentration, concentration actually decreased. So probably that's because there's a more poor of this consumption of this uh, uh, metabolite in the system. So put this together, this tells us that this is a, the nitrogen flow from, um, you have a higher nitrogen flow from alanine to glutamate to glutamine uh, in response to nitrogen imitation by the fungal host. So urea cycle is also a very important uh, nitrogen metabolism pathway. So these two are also linked together. So first you can see that all the abundance, all the enzymes involved in urea cycle, their abundance didn't show significant changes. But if you look at uh, the data more closely, you can find that the first step of the urea cycle from uh, ammonia entering, going to this, this enzyme actually have a uh, allostatic activator that's uh, acetoglutamate. So this uh, uh, metabolized concentration increased by almost tenfold. So this will imply that this enzyme is being activated allosterically. And uh, correspondingly, 
the reverse reaction from urea to ammonia. So this is a, uh, uh, this enzyme is the ureas can be activated by ureas, but the only to suppress the conversion of urea to ammonia, it, uh, the fungal host uh, decreased the abundance of urea by sixfold. So again, this shows you that to do the conversion from ammonia to urea, it really engaged a multiple multi-model regulation, and uh, this can only be apparent by combining multiple omics analysis. Okay, let's switch gear to carbon metabolism. So this is a glycolysis. In, the, in all four conditions, the glucose is actually the main carbon and uh, energy source for the, whole, for the fungal growth. You know, so here we are looking at the, in the most likely use of the glycolysis to, pro, to drive this uh, acetyl-CoA production. Again, the enzyme abundance didn't change much. All this, uh, so you can see the full the annotation, uh, the symbol here. But what we found instead is uh, in this uh, prove uh, dehydrogenase, this is actually a very conserved uh, phosphorylation event. So this is uh, our uh, fungal, and uh, this is a plant, different plant yeast. So it's known that uh, in, this in this serine residue, in all these organisms, you can use uh, phosphorylation to uh, inhibit that inhibit this activity of uh, the activity of this prove dehydrogenase. And uh, in this, uh, in the nitrogen limitation, we actually found uh, the phosphorylation extend actually decre in increased by sevenfold. So that means, in this step, the fungal is actually phosphorylated enzyme in order to inhibit its activity. So it only not only inhibit this step, but also inhibit the next step. So this is a prove kinase. Uh, prove kinase. And uh, this enzyme has an uh, allostatic inhibitor, that's alanine. And also alanine's concentration increased by sixfold. So you can see, so usually when organisms want to achieve a certain mode regulation, it can, can achieve that through a, a concor multiple concordant regulation. So in this case, it uses the phosphorylation plus uh, uh, allostatic inhibition. So if, uh, so what's the advantage of this regulation? So you can see that uh, in this case, it can preserve all the protein stock. So that means if there's a, the, the growth condition changes and the enzyme, the organism need to use uh, glycolysis for energy production, it doesn't need to produce all these new enzymes. It can switch that on very, very quickly by just uh, take away that phosphorylation and also remove the excess concentration of alanine. This really allows the organism to respond to environment change in a very much more um, timely fashion and also be much more energy efficient. If the organism is not using gly uh, glucose for uh, carbon source, then what is it using for carbon source? So we can look at the beta oxidation. Of course, uh, fatty acids are the common uh, compound for um, energy source. Here we actually found that all this enzyme concentration increased uh, uh, a lot significantly in this uh, nitrogen limitation condition. That tells us that probably fu this fun fungus switched uh, to the fatty acid from glucose for gr uh, carbon. Then where fatty acid come from? We didn't provide fatty, or fatty acids or lipids in our growth media. Um, so the fatty, uh, the lipids also, the degradation of lipids also generate this uh, compound, glycerol, and also we can see the accumulation of this in the medias by metabolomics. So where did li lipids come from? To make sure that we have lipids. So we did a staining. So this is a red staining that can stain the lipid in the culture. So we do see extensive lipid accumulation in all four conditions. But nitrogen limitation uh, stimulated the organism to use their lipid stock in this particular growth uh, stages. So here, we can see the, um, we show the, uh, the TCS cycle because the intermediates in the TCS cycle are used in many biosynthesis uh, pathways. The enzyme uh, and the um, metabolic concentration are regulated uh, very differently. You don't see a uniform up and down regulation to, to change the carbon, the metabolized fluxes. But one interesting thing is uh, we found that uh, the malate synthesis through this uh, glyco glyoxylate pathway increases significantly. So in nitrogen limitation, why does the fungal need to increase the production of malate? So hold on to this thought. So the next question is, uh, 
what does the fungus provide to the endobacteria? So we all know that the host, what's the dependency, metabolic dependency between these two organisms? We know that endobacteria has a reduced genome. It only encodes about 2,000 genes. And also in the natural pool condition, proteomics identified about one third of these uh, proteins. And uh, we can infer which uh, metabolite imported from fungal host by looking at which genes are present versus which genes are expressed. So this is uh, the metabolism, the carbon metabolism of the uh, endobacteria. So we have three categories. One is the, this gene is encoded in genome, and also we identify this protein in this condition. That means the endobacteria is probably carrying out this reaction. So in the second category, the, the genes are encoded in the genome, but we didn't identify it by proteomics. That means the endobacteria can do this um, activity, but it may not be doing that in the, this particular condition. And finally, the gene is absent, and the protein is also absent. That means the endobacteria lost its function. So first, uh, we identified uh, a four TCA cycle and a four electron transport chain inside the antibacteria. That means if the antibacteria is uh, independent from the host uh, for all these intermediates and also for the TC, uh, ATP production. So to carry all this, all these reactions, you need a, a source for the acetyl-CoA. So what's the most obvious source? So I mentioned earlier that glucose is part in the media, right? Of course, glycolysis. So this is a pathway from glycolysis to acetyl-CoA. Lots of these steps are shared between glycolysis and uh, gluconeogenesis, except the three step, this step, this step, and uh, this step, step. So interestingly, we found uh, all these three genes are missing in the genome. That means somehow the endobacteria is not uh, lost the ability to do glycolysis. But correspondingly, you actually found all the other enzymes in the in the expressed in this condition. That means instead of um, importing glucose to drive the TCA cycle, it's actually using some uh, acetyl-CoA to make all these uh, six-ring sugars. But the question still remains, if it's uh, driving the TCA cycle and uh, do all the, all the glycosis, glycogluconeogenesis, what's the uh, carbon source? But looking at the genome, we found something very interesting. It encodes uh, 12 copies of this uh, malate citrate transporter. So you can see that this is the uh, endobacteria. You have a reduced genome. You lost the gene for glycolysis. Why do you need a 12 copy of malate transporter? That tells us uh, it's doing something related to the malate synthesis. So recall in the previous slide, I told you that in natural limitation conditions, the fungal host boosted the malate production a lot. And also in the, you know, we know that uh, in the natural poor condition, you have much higher, uh, uh, large, much larger endobacterial population. So you would uh, think, okay, so you can import a malate or citrate to drive the TCA cycle. But uh, if you just enter the TCA directly, you cannot do that because you will result in an open TCA cycle. Lots of intermediates will be accumulated. So instead, we found uh, another enzyme encoding the endobacterial genome called mal uh, um, malate enzyme that can convert the malate to prove it. So we believe that's the pathway that uh, endobacteria is using. Basically, it's uh, importing malate from the fungal host and then convert it to prove it. Then this prove it can be used to, for, to drive uh, the gluconeogenesis pathway and also this TCA cycle. Uh, furthermore, we found uh, the pathways for uh, peptoglycan biosynthesis. So this is really used for uh, making cell walls in the in endobacteria. We identified most of the enzymes you needed uh, for this pathway, and also on this side, we found it, uh, we found the entire pathway for pru uh, purine and uh, pyridine biosynthesis. So this is really to um, make to make uh, um, DNA and RNA um, precursors. So this means the endobacteria is uh, actively making cell wall and uh, doing DNA uh, replication even in uh, a very nice and constrained condition. So last we look at the uh, amino acid biosynthesis. So this is the 20 amino acid. So we color coded them into different categories. The red one means uh, the endobacteria actually encodes the full biosynthesis pathway for those enzymes. So we, this is uh, the enzymes that's needed to make in this amino acid. And this is how many of them are encoded in the genome, and this is how many of them are identified by the proteome. So all these uh, 
uh, amino acid encoded red are being actively synthesized by the antibacteria themselves. The blue ones are the amino acids that uh, the antibiotic cannot make, essentially because they are missing those genes in the genome. So that means the antibiotic is dependent on the fungal host to provide a certain type of essential amino acids. But also the, the black ones are partially missing or partially expressed in these two conditions. And also we found a lot of transporters expressed or encoded in these conditions. In addition, we found a lot of uh, dipeptide transporters and peptidase. So this means the, the endobacteria can import a lot of different uh, amino acids from the, ho from the fungal host uh, to drive its uh, nitrogen metabolism. So in summary, we, I think I told you two stories. One is the, how does the fungal host uh, respond to nitrogen limitation? So we, uh, we determine in a certain way of this nitrogen flux and the carbon flux from the lipid to to glucose, but the important thing to remember is uh, we believe this is very general. So our organism can use uh, many modes of uh, regulation to regulate metabolism. So that include uh, enzyme abundance changes, PTMs, reactant concentration, reactant concentration changes, and also aerostatic regulations. Now, before we, we are very um, frequent to ignore some of these uh, uh, regulations, but now with the different omics technology, we can uh, illustrate all these changes now. And uh, secondly, we also found that the endobacteria most likely extracted the mainly from the fungal host as a primary carbon substrate for energy production and uh, many biosynthesis pathways. Also, we found uh, many um, transporters encoded in, in the endobacteria for importing nitrogen compounds from the fungal host to support its metabolism. So this is a study that is carried out by a large team and funded by DOE. So we have 15 minutes for questions. Hey, um, I just have a quick question for the <coughs> so for when you are keeping track of all the functions that are rapid or that have gone through many gene gain and loss events, so or, or the functions have gone through many gain and loss events. Were you guys keeping track of any characteristics that surrounded the gene? So things like repeat regions, uh, uh, any um, phage genes or tRNAs that might give some sort of characteristic about how that gene was jumping around from uh, organism to organism? Right, right. So that's a very good question. If we have someone to carry on that research, that's the next question we want to ask. So the next thing is uh, how many genes are required for that function, right? Mm -hmm. So if uh, you have a function that's, uh, you can imagine if a function needs only a few genes, it's much easier to go through the gene gain in the last event versus you have uh, like 10, 20 genes. So we could do a correlation between those two things, or the plus the uh, genome context. Right. The, the difficult part about genome context is uh, a lot of those 14,000 genomes are uh, very drafty genomes. So they are broken into many, many pieces. We believe their gene content is complete. Basically, we have all the genes there. But it's very hard to figure out what's the context of those genes So that because they are fragmented. So that would be one challenge. If you limit yourself to only finished genome, then the number become much, much reduced. Uh, in your pathway metabolite analysis, in your um, when you were finding fold change increases in metabolites that kind of led you to clues into what how things may have been regulated, were you seeing that all of these fold changes were significant fold changes? Uh, were, were they being tested for statistical significance or something like that? And when I've tried to do it, I've seen fold changes, but the data tend to be so variable or so much variation in the data between replicates, it, it's really difficult to say that there's something really significant to this. I don't know if I'm explaining what I'm... Right, and yes. So in this study, that's a, we have a biological triplicate of virtual condition, and uh, we did a t-test on all the metabolite com abundant changes. So we are only showing the, showing the statistically significant changes. We could also add a, a air bar on all those uh, uh, full changes. So, but uh, you, in this case, because we are doing a lab condition, we are able to grow them in a very 
controlled fashion. If you go to the environment, you will have much larger variability. So then, yes, that will be a much bigger problem for the environmental samples. Yeah, I think the only way to get around that, if you cannot control the variability, you have to do more replications. Can, can I ask a question? Yep. I'm gonna jump back to the first part of your talk. So with respects to the phylogenetic tree right. that you built from those 14,000 plus genomes, out of curiosity, what did you use? What, was, what, what information from the genomes did you use to build those trees? Was it only genes that were shared by all 14,000 or did you come up with a really clever way to deal with genes that were absent in right. or present only in a fraction of those genomes? Um, so we used a tool for that. So <laughs> So that the way we understand that tool is uh, they come up with about uh, one to two hundred uh, genes. That's uh, very commonly found across all the branches. Then they can do a multiple sequence alignment of those uh, genes. Then, of course, uh, we also have the question about uh, is this tree reliable or not? Then we can compare with taxonomy. We do see some discrepancy between the tree built by that tool versus the uh, phylogenetic taxonomy. But I would say the discrepancy is not too great. So the way you can look at it is uh, if the I mean, that's one of our main concerns, taxonomy versus the phylogenetics. So in here is the, so we really showed the, the taxonomy highlights in the, um, the color of the, the nodes. If you see discrepancy, you, it will look like something like this. You have uh, this uh, taxon identification mixed with some other, other taxon in the same brand clay. Yeah, but that, that's again a research problem in itself. So 60S uh, is a, uh, is, uh, a very uh, low resolution we are doing the taxonomy, so that's why we stayed away from it. We did seriously consider about 16s, but it's a bit more complicated. Well, if there's no more questions, um, please join me in thanking Chongo again for a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.